that abrupt ending, but I was just about to reach the 15 minute mark and I can't post to YouTube if it goes over 15 minutes. So I needed to make a quick stop. Okay. Continuing on with where we were now, we are actually ready to solve some problems using all this vast information. You'll notice that I have this important information that you need written on the sideboards as well so you can look at it as we work this. This first problem asks us to find or tells us the terminal side of an angle, angle theta, passes through the coordinates negative two squared to three five, and wants us to find the secant of that angle. Okay. In trigonometry, if you're ever in doubt, the answer to most questions is a picture is worth a thousand words. If you draw a picture of the triangle you're working with, you can usually figure out what you need to know. And this is most certainly the case here. So if we draw a picture, we know the terminal side of this angle, meaning the ang side of the angle that moves around the circle, we know it passes through the coordinates negative 2 square root of 3, 5, which means it goes left 2 square root of 3 and up 5, which would put it out in the second quadrant somewhere. Okay. You do not need to draw these to scale. You just go, okay, it went left, it went up. Draw yourself an angle out in that general direction. It doesn't have to be to scale at all. Okay. We need to form a triangle. Anytime you form a triangle, you always form it by drawing to the x-axis. You never draw over to the y-axis. This will mess you up. Okay. I now have a triangle. Since I know the coordinates in this particular case that we went left 2 square root 3, that means my x on the bottom here had to go to negative 2 square 3, and we went up 5. That must mean my y side must be 5. They want us to find the secant of this angle. Well, if you check your all-star, not excuse me, your stick your rotten crazy xylophone list, you'll discover that secant is r over x. If secant is r over x, we need to know side r and side x in this picture. Well, I got side x. I know side x is negative 2 over the square root of 3. Problem is, I don't know side r. But being the wizards of geometry that we are, we notice that, hey, dudes, I know two sides of a right triangle. So therefore, I can do Pythagorean theorem and find the third side that I need. Now, here's where I typically see some simple algebra errors. How do you square negative 2 times the square root of 3? simply square each one separately. Squaring 2 will get you 4. Of course, it's going to be positive. Squaring the square root of 3 gets you 3. 4 times 3 is 12. And so now when I add it up, I have 37 equals r squared. However, I need r, not r squared. So, of course, I'm going to square root both sides and find out that r could be plus or minus square root of 37. Okay, you have to look at the picture and use your knowledge and go, which one would it be, positive or negative, square root of 37? Well, first of all, R is the radius. So, and we said R is always positive, so yeah, that means this radius is square root of 37. Which means I can now take that and put it on top here because I know R is square root of 37. Unfortunately, they will not let you leave your answer in that form. They will not le let you leave square root of 3 on the bottom. So you will be forced to rationalize it. Only multiply by the square root of 3, not the 2. It will make it be become too large and you will just have to reduce your fraction anyhow. If I take square root of 37 times 3, yes, you are legally allowed to multiply the entire size of square root. So that's going to give me 111. Now, on the bottom, what do I get? Well, square root of 3 times itself is 3. Times 2 would be negative 6. Square root of 111 isn't going to break down, so there is our answer. Square root of 111 over negative 6. Don't expect to get the world's nicest numbers on these. Scrolling back up here to the top, this is a similar type of problem. You will have to draw a picture. In this case, they're telling us we know cosine of this ang unknown angle. We have no idea what 
emphasize the angle is, nor do we really need to know or care. Cosine is a negative 3 seventh. And they're telling us the cotangent of the same angle. You need to recognize any time you see theta, that means it's the same angle. They want us to find sine. Once again, the answer to everything, if you're in doubt, draw a picture. So if I draw a picture of this situation, the big question is, well, how do I know which quadrant to put my angle in? I've got four choices. Well, look at your positives and negatives. In this particular instance, you see that cosine is negative, and it says cotangent is greater than zero, which means cotangent is positive. Well, for me, I would look at, hey, what quadrant is cotangent positive in? That's what's in the all-star trig class table. Cotangent is positive in first and third. But I also need to be where cosine is negative. So it can't be first, which means that, hey, this one must be in the third quadrant. So I'm going to, once again, just draw an angle out into the third quadrant. I am going to go up to the x-axis, never draw over to the y. Now, how do I get the length of some of these sides? Well, what's the only numbers I know in the whole problem? The only numbers I know is the fact that cosine is 3 7 excuse me, negative 3 7 but I do know that cosine is x over r, so therefore, if cosine is x over r, that means x must be 3, r must be 7. You have to decide which one x is negative, because it could be 3 over negative 7. And by looking at your picture, you go, well, r is never negative. Cosine, or x is going left, so x must be negative. We are out to find the sine of this angle, so which means we need to know sine, which is y over r. So I need side y and side r. Since I don't know side y here, I am simply going to do some more Pythagorean theorem. Negative 3 squared plus y squared equals 7 squared. Be sure you pay attention to which one, which one is the hypotenuse. So if I get 9 plus y squared equals 49, that means y squared equals 40. And when I square root it, I technically get plus or minus 2 times the square root of 10. Okay. You, once again, have to look at the picture. It, you must draw a picture. That, this is another one. If you don't draw a picture, you will lose points. You have to draw the picture. This, this particular section is one of those my way or the highway deals. So you would look at this and go, well, y is going downward. Since this y is going downward, it must be negative 2 times the square root of 10. Now you can answer your question. What is y over r? Well, it's negative 2 times the square root of 10 over r, which is 7. We don't need to rationalize that one, so we have a good answer. The key to trigonometry is drawing a picture. What you just did right here, drawing these pictures, this is going to be the bottom step of many, many other trig problems, just the way the factoring a quadratic is the bottom step of a million other algebra problems. All right, our last little thing, short and sweet. Some of you may remember this handy-dandy chart from last year. I'm just trying to show you what values your various trig functions can actually take on. And so, over here to the right are some triangle pictures. Notice that the angles are getting bigger in each picture. What I want to know is, signs y over r. In the first triangle, y is short and r is pretty long. Second one, y is getting bigger. Third one, y is getting really big. r is the radius and the hypotenuse, so it's still bigger. My question to you is, how big a number can y over r come out to be? Well, since y is always going to be smaller than the number on the bottom, r, y, it, we're always going to get a fraction value where the number on top is smaller. That means it's going to be less than 1. In fact, if this angle could go straight up, y and r would be the same length, so it could equal 1. So therefore, it shows us that sine has to always have values bigger than 0, but less than 1. So sine can always be found 
low, this line is one, this line is negative one. In fact, it'll turn out it can be caught, since it can sometimes be negative, it, it will be caught somewhere between one and negative one. You will never find sine has a value larger than one or negative one. It's not possible. All values of sine are between one and negative one. Okay, cosine does the same thing. Cosine is x over r. Is side x ever going to get bigger than side r? No. So therefore, it's going to follow just like sine. The most that can happen is side x can equal side r, in which case it could equal 1. So sine and cosine both always fall between 1 and negative 1. If you then think about it, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So if sine is always a fraction like a half, two-thirds, three-fourths, and you'll get cosecant by flipping it over. So sine equals a half, three-fourths, two-thirds, two-fifths. You flip it over, cosecant is going to be upside down, two over one, four over three, three over two, five over two. That means cosecant is always going to have a value bigger than one. So secant and cosecant will always be outside 1 and negative 1. They cannot have values inside. Okay, last but not least is tangent. Tangent, well, tangent is kind of a pain in this instance. You know, some of these pictures, y is bigger than x. The bigger one's on top, smaller one's on the bottom. But in other ones, the small, y is the smaller one and x is the bigger one. So what do I conclude when sometimes the bigger number's on top, sometimes the smaller number's on top? Well, hopefully you're going, that means it can be anywhere, and you're right. Tangent and cotangent can have values anywhere they can equal any number. Okay. They are going to ask you to do a few problems here, and I'm sorry I didn't get these erased before I started. Let me ditch them a sec. They're going to give you some problems and say possible or impossible. So can cosecant equal a negative square root of 7? Who cares about the square root of 7 other than what its decimal value is? Square root of 7 bigger than square root of 4, less than square root of 9. So it's you know somewhere in between 2 and 3. It's 2 point something or negative. Okay, is it possible for cosecant to have a value that's two point something? If you look at this chart, you go, yeah, secant and cosecant are always outside one and negative one, so yep, it can happen. So therefore, that one's possible. The second one, you can't tell because sine's not by itself. So if they do this to you, you're gonna have to actually solve for sine first to answer the question. If I subtract five and then divide by two. I'll end up with sine equals 7 halves, or 3.5. Can sine have a value of 3.5? Well, according to our chart, sine can only be between negative 1 to positive 1. It can't have 3.5. So this would be an impossible problem. And that's all you're going to be asked to do is to name whether they're possible or impossible. Hopefully, that makes fairly good sense. This is, like I said, Trig basics. You just got to learn to work with these fundamental concepts before we can go farther. The stuff you learned today will bother you to come back for you throughout the semester. This is not something you can just learn for a day and blow off. This is learn for a lifetime. So, signing off now from the frigid, frigid water air of room 103. You may have noticed that it's 10.58 p.m. on December 26th. The temperature in this room is a lovely 59 degrees. I'm standing here in three layers of clothing and a coat and one mitten. So, too bad you missed seeing this lovely action, but the important thing is you learned the great trigonometry. So now, put yourselves to work. Use the time you've got left to get your assignment done. A quiz may be coming your way.